Making Let's Go Pikachu a hard game may seem like an impossible task, but today we're going to prove that wrong. The Art Lock is back, and this time we're tackling the Kanto region. The normal Nuzlocke rules are still here. I can only use the first Pokemon I catch on each route. No healing in battle, and if a Pokemon faints, it's gone forever. In addition, just like in BDSP, we will be matching the number of Pokemon owned by each gym leader. But, instead of leveling up to their maximum level, I will be at 85% of the usual level cap. Early on, I may only be down a couple levels, but very quickly it will ramp up to a 10 or even 13 level disadvantage, locking me out of level up moves, evolutions, some gift Pokemon, and on top of all of that, I will not be accepting the partner Pikachu. We start our adventure by speaking to Professor Oak about how we don't need a starter, because actually we bought one off Wish. Just look at this little Pikachu, he's got it all. The spiky tail, the yellow face, the black soulless eyes, and ah, he even hurts to touch. Since we clearly have the top percentage of Pikachu, I wanted to give him a manly name, so welcome Elfman to the team. I'm a real man! You want me to prove it to ya? With our new Pika Pal, we head towards Viridian City and fill up our team slots right away. First, we catch a promising young Oddish named Kaiba and give him his first ever deck. I'm sure he'll grow up into a confident, respectable young man. Draw your last pathetic card so I can end this, Yugi. Next is Nidoran female named Mira and a Pidgey named Azir. Even dragons look up to the sun. Azir single-handedly exterminated the entire population of Viridian Forest, except for our new Setsuno the Butterfree. And finally picking up Hamlin the Ratata before taking on the first gym. They torment people like you and me for fun, but then the moment a nemesis appears, they want us to march out and die for them! Elfman keeps sticking to all the rocks around the gym and sucking out their metals. I think maybe I should see a vet about it, but first we need to beat up Brock for some money. We lead off with Elfman at level 10 against his Geodude. Elfman throws up all the metal that he was eating and takes out the Geodude in one hit. Brock sends out his level 12 Onyx, but Elfman's upset stomach has no equal, and we easily win our first gym badge. On our way to Mount Moon, we catch a Charmander and Geodude while Mira evolves. Our team has to be swapped around a bit during longer areas like this because our level cap only jumps to 16 now instead of the usual 19. We catch a Venonat and after helping Bill cover up his illegal experiments, we take on Misty. Despite our level deficit, the second gym badge is easily obtained with a few Thunderbolts and Absorbs. We have much harder fights to get to later. So with that surprisingly easy second gym out of the way, I'm starting to get worried for Lieutenant Surge. My new level cap is only 22 compared to his 26, so that leaves me out of getting Graveler or Doug Trio. So I need to think about my team very carefully while I enjoy myself on the SSN. Along the way we stop by the Pokemon Center to trade for a special tropical Geodude we named Jura. I've been wary of you and your guild for some time, Jalal, but I never expected you to assume the role of a fairy tale wizard. After an uneventful rival battle, we head to the Vermilion Gym. Surge's Raichu threatens my Geodude, Gloom, Nidorina, Raticate, Pikachu, and Growlithe. As much as I don't want to use the Moonstone this early, Nidoqueen is one of the only answers into this fight at such a low level. As a Nidorina, Mira is a polite bartender, but as a Nidoqueen, she summons her Devil Takeover magic and is no longer to be messed with. We lead with Jura to set up a stealth rock, but end up taking a third of our HP from a Thunderbolt. After a free switch in Amira, a couple digs take out Surge's team for a painless third gym badge. But after defeating Surge, I saw Elfman rummaging around in the trash, and he found a family of tiny Pikachu. Lieutenant Surge told me they lost their parent Meltan. I wasn't sure what he meant for a second, but with context clues, I think Meltan is just a weird American accent thing for Pikachu. I could see the look on Elfman's face that he wanted to stay behind and take care of his fellow Pikachu. So, with a heavy heart, we say goodbye to our first partner and leave him with Lieutenant Surge. To replace him, I pick up a Mr. Mime. A silly humanoid Pokemon like this deserves the silliest character to be named after. With his winning smile and devotion to his craft, welcome Lord Degolus to the team. You aren't pretty or redheaded enough to be asking about my anatomy, Sir Thunder Thighs! Though I confess that crossing blades with you is thrilling, and you are swiftness personified! Ah! Jura also evolves during this time, growing his beard even longer, and is now using his staff to channel his electric powers. 
We pick up a few more encounters on the way to Celadon City, including a Spearow, Krabby, Jigglypuff, Porygon, Kangaskhan. Even though I keep telling myself to avoid Coach Trainers, for some reason I just keep on battling them. Coach Trainer Elpesh is already at our level cap of 29 and leads with a Farfetch to half health's Hamlin with one facade. We switch to Jura but end up taking up Razor Leaf for another 50%. Panicked, I switch to Kaiba against the Wigglytuff and Poison Powder it. Half my team is at 50% health, and I start frantically switching, trying to find a way out of this. Oh my goodness! What do I do? Just let this poison do its job. Wait, it's- I poisoned a facade Wigglytuff! What is wrong with me? Oh no. I have no idea what to do. I- why did I poison it? I- oh no, why am I fighting this coach trainer? I have to hope and pray as Yer wakes up, lands a headbutt, and flinches. <laughs> I can't sack anybody else. We woke up. We had- please flinch, please flinch, please, please, please. No! Oh, Whoa, here lies a major issue with Let's Go Art Locks. Unlike BDSP, there aren't medicines to lower friendship in this game, so there's like a 10-20% to chance your Pokemon will just randomly live a hit that would otherwise kill them. In those situations, I'll try not to damage the enemy Pokemon on the following turn so that they can knock us out more legitimately. However, there will be moments in this playthrough where I specifically sit down to spend a couple hours purposefully losing to one trainer over and over again to lower my affection. I do kinda need to do this to keep the integrity of the Nuzlocke, Otherwise, when our friendship gets too high, we'll be permanently dodging moves, we'll be critting, we'll be surviving everything. So every couple gyms, I'll find a strong trainer and just chain losses against them purposefully, but those will not count towards the run. Azir was a reliable teammate. I'm not sure how he lived one facade to begin with. He may have been cursed with an early Nuzlocke trying, but I was excited to see him grow into a Mega Pidgeot. So with that loss, our team into Erika is going to look a little different now. We use a Firestone to bring back Daijo from the BDSP art lock, add Mokuba the Charmeleon with this awful Ultra Sun art lock drawing, and bring Setsuna the Butterfree back onto the team. Erika leads with a level 33 Tangla as we set up Quiver Dances on Setsuna. A couple of turns of bind damage while put to sleep brings us down to about half before waking up and one-shotting with an Air Slash. That brings out the level 34 Vile Plume, who hits us with the Moon Blast down to about quarter HP. A crit definitely would have taken us out. Fortunately, two air slashes take it out and the Weeping Bell just falls on the next turn. That battle may have been easy, but what follows is the gauntlet of champions. Our next level cap is only three levels higher than Erika's ace. Outside of the Elite Four, this may be the hardest part of this run. With only a few levels of flexibility, we have to take on the Rocket Hideout, Pokemon Tower, the Fighting Dojo, Pokemon Road, Sylph Company, the Saffron City Gym, and the Fuchsia City Gym. Close to 50 trainers stand between us and the next level cap, and we will need an army to get through them. With Setsuna back on the team and Daiju and Mokuba in the box, we have a pretty strong team for Rocket Hideout. With all the Poison Electric flying in normal types, Jura the Graveler and Lord Degullus the Mr. Mime can easily take out the Rocket Grunts and Scientists. Jura and Mira can handle Jesse and James's Arbok and Weezing as easily as ever. Archer isn't much different. Without the fast and powerful Houndoom available in this game, he's essentially an overleveled Grunt. His Weezing goes down right away and it only takes a couple of turns of switching and chipping away for his oversized bat to meet the same fate. Giovanni is up next, his Persian fake outs Jura and follows it up with a few weak slashes just as we set up Stealth Rock and begin throwing Thunder Punches. But by the time Rhyhorn comes out, Jura is down to a third HP. If I'm scared of a Ground-type move, I could switch to Setsuna, but if I get hit with a Rock-type move, then Putterfree won't live to see another fight. I switch to Kaiba on a Horn Drill that might have killed us if it crit. Gloom is just barely faster than Rhyhorn normally, but at a 5 level disadvantage, I'm not sure if that will matter. Looking at my team, I don't see an easy way out of here. Jura and Mira will both likely faint from one drill run. Hamlin, Setsuna, and Lord Degolus won't do enough damage back after barely surviving one. And that's assuming they aren't struck by a critical hit. 
I have an incredible idea for Vile Plume's drawing, but it all hinges on if Kaiba can use those tiny legs and huge clown feet to outrun this Rhyhorn. I click Mega Drain, and Gloom outspeeds and lands the Mega Drain for the one shot, and we can move on to the next part of this gauntlet. Pokemon Tower is mostly uneventful, it's about 30 minutes of Lord Degullus outspeeding and one-shotting 70 different Ghastly and Haunter with Psybeam and Shadow Ball, while Jura and Mira remind Jesse and James that they can't deal with ground types. So every time I've played Kanto, I always head down Pokemon slash Cycling Road after Lavender Town. Koka has always felt like the natural fifth gym leader to me, but the Pokemon around him are 10 levels higher than the trainers around Sabrina. I did not remember this, and foolishly ran towards Fuchsia City. Ace Trainer Johnson caught my gaze and our battle began. Wait, this is a level 40 War Turtle. I switched into Lord Degullus to set up a light screen, but take half of my health and damage before taking out the War Turtle. Up next is a Magneton who flash cannons mirror twice for two thirds before I can dig once to take it out. Last is Marowak. I switch into Setsuna to dodge a Bone Meringue. Once again, Mega Drain on Setsuna would come in handy, but I'm forced to Bug Buzz instead. Mmm, not as much damage as- oh no! Be tough to that, that counts as a death. <sighs> I'm sorry, Setsuna. I knew he would have had a rock move, but... There's nothing else I can really do. And unfortunately, I have to just waste this turn. Because it's not fair that if you're dead for me to attack again. Our beautiful fly. Not that one. Or that one. Takes a rock slide for the one hit KO. This might be further in the game than most Butterfree are taken, but with the gauntlet we're in, having access to bug and psychic type moves made Setsuna incredibly useful for both Gyms and Sylph Company. Losing her means I might need to run a tighter ship going towards Sylph. Hamlin's able to take out the Marowak in a few crunches, and we limp back to Celadon to rebuild. We have a few more Alolan Pokemon available to us, and one sticks out above the rest. A fierce warrior and master of the elements as well as the dark arts. A fire-breathing ghost who can manipulate the very earth. Ground coverage for Sylph and Koga, Ghost Stab for Sabrina, Fire Stab for Jinx and Venomoth, Immunity to Explosion for Archer, and it's above the level cap. Damn it! But hey, at least I found this rat with a cool hat. The little surfer kid Taj has joined our team, but with his low defenses along with okay speed and special attack, I'm a bit worried how well he'll do. That's our eldest son Taj! You mean he's still alive? alive? Well, of course I am! Don't go killing me off yet! He's not the only new team member. To bring balance back to our team after the loss of Setsuna, Captain Dart Dragonov has joined the team with Psychic, Leech Life, and Gust. He's a coverage machine who provides the same great offense versus Team Rock in the fighting dojo. While the poison typing kind of ruins the possibility of using him against Sabrina. Don't let the shadows get too close. There's a chance the sorcerer is hiding inside one waiting for the time to strike. <laughs> Joining them is Kaiba, who has now reached his full potential. The second I saw Oddish, I knew his head would make a great dual disc. Pretty soon, he'll summon the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon and show you why he should be King of Games. The Fighting Dojo is the last place in Kanto where any important trainer is even with us in battle. The Black Belts all fall to Lord Degolus and Kaiba as we choose Hitmonlee as our prize. Hitmonchan is one of my favorite Pokemon of all time, but I try not to reuse Artlock Pokemon too frequently. Our team is currently around level 34 and we have to defeat 35 trainers, including Blue, Archer, and Giovanni, without passing level 37. Our experience juggling is very important. Not only can we not pass 37, we still then have 10 gym trainers after Sylph, but before the gym leaders. This is one of the tightest challenges I've done in any Pokemon game. First, we have to prepare our strategy for each gym leader and figure out the leftovers for Sylph. For Sabrina's psychic types, I need to have Lord Degullus, Hamlin, Ur, and Osethi, the new Alolan Dug Trio. Each head of the Dug Trio is a main character from Radiant. So, Okaho, Seth, and Melly. And I'd break your chains if I could. But they're in your heart and your mind, and you put them on! For Koga and his poison types, I need to have Mira, Daija, Taj, and the newly evolved Jura. That leaves everyone else for Sylph, along with a couple new members. Alongside Kaiba and Dragonov, we also add Alan the Alolan Sandslash. 
Bring forth salvation to this tormented Akuma soul! With access to Ice Punch and Dig, he's comparable to Osethi when it comes to dealing with rocket grunts, and Laguna the Kingler, who is mostly here to brute force through Blue, Giovanni, and a couple gym trainers. Overall, we need about 11 team members to bring us through these 35 battles. The fight against Blue can go very badly if you aren't prepared. His executor goes down to a flamethrower from Daisha, but a psychic brings us all the way down to 30%. We switch into Jura expecting an air slash. After a heat wave miss, we score a quick victory over Blue. Heading towards the first floor of Sylph, our team consists of Osethi, Kaiba, Alan, Dragonov, Mira, and Taj, all at level 34. We start at floor 1, work our way up, defeating every trainer on each floor before we can get the card key and start the process all over again. So it's basically 22 floors of trainers, with the boss fight before, in the middle, and after. Osethi can slash an earthquake through the Raticates, Coughings, Voltorbs, and Golbats. The occasional Haunter or Grimer isn't really enough to stop us. Osethi has been single-handedly sweeping rocket grunts on every floor, not even exploding Coughing or Electrode can shut us down. We have some close calls with the weird trainer classes like Jugglers, but limp our way to Archer. Trace and I announce our goals to destroy Team Rocket and challenge Doesn't Archer and his weirdly next. strong grunt to a battle. I just Trace and I lead off game. with Cubone and Osethi against Muck and Electrode. Electrode explodes turn 1, dealing 20% to Dugtrio while we Earthquake to take out the Muck. That brings in Weezing and Raticate. Raticate sucker punches Osethi, and our Earthquake doesn't do enough for the one-shot. Wait, this Weezing has Flamethrower. No. Please. Please? Oh my god. <laughs> this Weezing should be pretty straightforward. Oh. Wait, you're on- aren't you on the Sabrina team? And just like that, our Sabrina team loses a member and I am face to face to face with a flamethrower wheezing, which blocks me from using Dragonov or Alan. I'm scared Taj will overlevel to 38 if I use him and would also ruin my Koga team, so I switch to Ur. Trace finally uses a useful Pokemon and takes out the wheezing with an air slash, while Ur hides underground with the dig. Last up is Golbat, who comes in on an air slash, but a crit dizzy punch that confuses, just for Golbat to hit himself, ends the battle. But with Osethi leaving the team, our plans need to adjust. Hamlin rejoins while we work from the bottom up once more to take on all the grunts hiding behind the locked doors. With everyone on the team reaching 36 or 37, we replace Alan with Kaiba, Daijo with Lord Degolis, and Dragonov with Mokuba, as we take on the last stretch of Silphco. These later grunts and scientists have more Hypno, Muck, and Electrode, which can threaten us with more damage and with more experience. Once again, we double dig against Jesse and James, which are always easy, and get ready for Giovanni. We have kept enough team members at 35 or 6 to take on Giovanni without ruining the Nuzlocke by overleveling. Our Giovanni team is Laguna, Kaiba, Lord Degolis, Mira, Jura, and Hamlin. He leads with Persian against Laguna. The four level lead slashes bring Laguna too low to stay in against the two Pokemon he would actually be super effective against. We switch to Kaiba and get crit by a drill run for 60% before taking out the Rhyhorn. Giovanni's Rhyhorn will never compare to Kaiba. Kaiba and Giovanni's poorly trained Needle Queen trade body slams and Mega Drains back and forth until eventually we win and complete the Sylph Gauntlet. Next up is Sabrina. For the first time in my life, I chose to fight her before Koga. This team is now Lord Degullus, Hamlin, Alan, and Ur. We both lead with Mr. Mime. Despite my 6 level disadvantage, I can outspeed and set up a light screen. I hard switch to Hamlin expecting a double slap, but she sets up a reflect. We super fang a few times to bring Mr. Mime down to 25, before a crunch and a U-turn take it out. I send Lord Degullus back in, but Sabrina brings out her level 44 Alakazam. This is the beast written about in ancient texts, a Pokemon so powerful it has become legend, with a special attack stat of 135 and a speed stat of 120. There is practically nothing you can do before it attacks with Stab Psychics, ripping holes through your team, leaving its mark forever deep in your mind. For generations, your lineage will wake up to uncontrollable screams and pleas for their life, running from a monster they have never seen, but who has woven trauma into their very DNA. But in Let's Go, she only has Psychic and Nightshade, to both of which Hamlin is immune. We hard swap and one-shot it with a crunch. 
Next up is Slowbro. We U-turn into Lord Degolus, but take 50% from a surf. I set up light screen, hoping for a yawn, and switch back into Hamlin. The next surf still brings us down to half, as a crunch barely does a third. I'm forced to U-turn out once again into Ur, who then gets yawned. I don't want to switch into two more surfs, so we bite Slowbro down to a sliver and roll the dice on sleep turns, only to stay asleep and take half from Psychic. Praying for her Psychic, Hamlin comes back out, but takes a surf, bringing us down to only 12 HP. This final U-turn takes it out, and we send in Alan. Sabrina's last Pokemon, Jinx, misses a lovely kiss as an Iron Tail wins us the gym badge. I feel very good about how I played that battle. I felt a real Nuzlocker's pride with all of my swaps and baiting moves. So I'd love to start with Golem, set up Stealth Rock, switch into Mira, and instead of just trying to Drill Run and sweep, I want to start Dragon Tailing so that Stealth Rocks can do a bit of chip damage. Because <laughs> Taj the Raichu is incredibly frail, you poke him with a toothpick, he will die, and I'm not convinced that 98 special attack is enough to one-shot a bunch of bulky poison types. And then specifically for Venomoth, but also as dig for the others, I have Daija, because that Venomoth is scary. Weezing comes out first as we lead with Golem. Weezing protects so that we can stealth rock for free. I can't imagine the explosions turn to, I'm gonna Thunder Punch. We only take around 25% from that as Muck comes out. Expecting Sludge Bomb or Toxic, I switch to Mira, who's immune from Toxic. In order to set up some damage for Taj, I Dragon Tail out the Muck after taking a weak Moonblast. Out comes Venomoth, who outspeeds Mira and does close to 70% with a Psychic, while our Drill Run brings it down to 40%. I'm scared of a Bug Buzz switching into Taj, so I switch into Daija, who should outspeed and take it out with a Flamethrower. We take 30% from another Psychic, but we get outsped and a Sludge Bomb takes us out. Because I'm doing Koga, then Sabrina. I feel like that's how you're supposed to do it. I get to this A level, but let's be real. <laughs> Sabrina's definitely more of a six gym leader than Koga is. An incredibly consistent Pokemon, now lost in both BDSP and Let's Go Pikachu. It was an honor battling with you, Arcanine. We get the clean switch into Taj as Koga sends out Golbat. After taking the Stealth Rock damage, a Thunderbolt takes it out easily. Muck comes back out and takes a second round of rocks down to 55% HP. But somehow, Psychic can't get the KO. I feel like taking a Sludge Bomb. Oh no, I guess I do feel like taking a Sludge Bomb. You see all that purple ooze coming out of Taja's mouth? That was him eating the Sludge Bomb, the little surfer rat who could. Babied and underestimated, all gauntlet finally shows he has what it takes to fully join the team. But with that gym battle over, we have entered the point of Kanto where everyone is in their mid to late 40s and our level cap really starts to hate us. Heading to Cinnabar Island, we revive our Aerodactyl and Kabuto, but not only do they surpass Blaine's level cap, but also Giovanni's. Our team captain Kaiba has been powerful enough to carry us through these battles, but his usefulness is beginning to decline. He was unable to assist us during either Sabrina or Koga, but is ready to swing the power balance in our favor. With three cards already on the field, he casts Polymerization to unleash the new and improved Mokuba the Charizard. A monster with power beyond imagining! <sighs> now I create a dual monster without peer, with attack force so great that no monster can stand against him! I create the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon! With this new power on our team, we grab Laguna and set sail for Cinnabar. In order to even fight Joseph Blaine Biden and his kooky quiz masters, we have to navigate the Pokemon Mansion to find the secret key that opens the gym. Why is something this important hidden away in a dirty basement? Who knows? At least he's not a psychopath shaking people down for protection money. The very first trainer we meet has level 44 Rapidash compared to our Pokemon who are still in the late 30s. Most trainers in the mansion seem to be avoidable, but we quickly run into Scientist Brayden. He leads with level 45 Weezing, who outspeeds Jura and lands a critical sludge bomb that poisons us before we even dig. Unfortunately, our dig does less than half, so we switch to Dragonov to take the next sludge bomb and kill with the Psychic. Who would have thought Venomoth was this reliable at such a level disadvantage? 
Brayden sends out his Magmar next and we switch to Mokuba to take a flamethrower. We take around 60% before we can land our first dig. A third flamethrower brings us to only 11 HP without a crit, and we take it out with a second dig. If I lost Mokuba this quickly, I would have cried. Lastly is a Magneton who thunderbolts on my switch to Kaiba. I try to Mega Drain, but a Flash Cannon brings us down to the red. I was scared that with such a huge level lead, Charizard wouldn't be able to outspeed, and now my team is so low, I'm forced to rely on Charizard being faster. I switch to Laguna, ready to say my goodbyes. A Thunderbolt takes us out easily, and Mokuba comes back in. We outspeed and take the kill with Dig, but that pointless switching cost us my favorite Pokemon. But with no time to grieve, it's time for our 7th gym battle. Blaine leads Magmar and confuses Jura. Of course, with our luck, we continue to hit ourselves in confusion. We get off the Stealth Rock eventually, but then have to switch into Mira before a second low kick can knock us out. Mira drill runs the Magmar and out comes Rapidash. How much is this gonna do though? Oh! I sh Ooh, and I got burned. Damn. Come on, Mira. Land this one and we can switch. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I'm gonna switch to Mokuba. The problem is though, I probably don't outspeed enough that the recoil just takes it out. Yes, perfect. Do I outspeed? I don't outrage. Please tell me I live one outrage. It's not stab, it's not stab. Okay, good job Mokuba. Now it'd be great if you missed this and got confused. <laughs> or this could just kill? Of course it doesn't. And with all of that, we're now in an awkward spot. Mokuba, Mira, and Jura are all very low. Mira is burned. I'm not willing to lose Mokuba this quickly after such a long drawing process. Jura might be on our Elite Four team, and Nidoqueen is my second favorite Pokemon, and we just lost Kingler. So all that leaves us with the newly added Starmie, Zoe, who is returning from Sinnoh. My only shot is to hope Zoe can live in Outrage, Outspeed, and finish off the Arcanine with a Surf. And then hope Ninetales is frail enough to fall to a single Surf, or could miss a Fire Blast? Come on, Starmie, you can live one. Good job. Good job, good job. Good job, Zoe. Alright, outspeed and surf, please. Yes. Does this kill? You're at, like, no HP. Sweet. Now I should outspeed- Oh, the sign tells says quick attack, actually. Okay, Zoe, I need you to- Oh, you out- Okay, she didn't quick attack, so it doesn't kill. Does this kill? Oh, just barely. Miss? Ah. Oh. It was nice having you for this one battle, Zoe. It was, it was nice bringing you back from Sinnoh for this one fight. Alright, Mokuba should outspeed a Ninetales. Oh, shoot. Um, you, oh, you just quick attack me, actually. I'm so screwed. Wait, I'm so- Wait, I'm so screwed! You just quick attack me! Oh, it would be so nice if I had, like, a Rocky Helmet. Good night. Miss Fire Blast, Miss Fire Blast? No. Mm. <gasps> don't burn, don't burn. Oh my god, it didn't burn. Okay, Jura. Jura, please. Yes, that's Blaine. Oh, oh. oh my god, how did we make it out of that with only one death? Finally making it back to Viridian City, we're ready to take on Giovanni. One struggle with art locks is the time and effort I put into the art, especially if I know I won't be using a Pokemon very much, but I always try and make them look as nice as I can, so some end up being less creative redraws of like the official model art or sprite. At the time of writing this, I have no clue how long I'm going to be using these two members, but say hello to Noel the Gyarados. Do your worst, you good for nothing girl! Sea dragons, <laughs> and Moscow the Jinx. Moscow is a friend. Moscow. Actually, he's my personal servant. With them joining Vizsla and Kaiba, we have a foolproof strategy. We lead off with Noel and set up a reflect before one-shotting Doug Trio with Waterfall. That brings out Rhydon, so we get a free switch into Kaiba thanks to the reflect, and then we set up for a Mega Drain. What? I, I, did that really just happen? Did we just lose Kaiba like that? That's how we lose Kaiba. I'm so upset. I'm so upset. What the hell? 
Well, that forces me to switch into Vizsla for the first Mega Evolution of the run. We take out Rhydon with the Surf, and luckily, Nido King never goes for a Horn Drill, but it does weaken us with a critical hit Earthquake. Last up is Nido Queen, so we pivot to Noel on a new Earthquake and win the battle with a Waterfall. But we have to say goodbye to a hero. We have to give... We have to say our goodbyes to Kaiba the Vile Plume. Our very first encounter, and the second I saw Oddish, I knew Vile Plume's head would make a good dual disc. He was our oldest team member. What a good drawing, too. I really like this drawing. It's been great traveling with you, Kaiba. Hope you enjoy your retirement. The level discrepancy grew throughout our journey, but has been nothing compared to what comes next. My favorite part of every Pokemon Nuzlocke is the Victory Road in Elite Four. We have to fight through a gauntlet of Ace Trainers with incredibly powerful Pokemon to even attempt a 9 level difference Elite Four. These trainers are scary and carry legitimately good Pokemon to the point where I have to prepare for every single battle individually. We had some close calls and risked a lot of critical hits, but we made it through Deathless. Finally, we've made it to the Indigo Plateau. Only five battles separate us from becoming the champion, so let's meet our new team. Hitting the new level cap of 48, we are bringing Atlan the Sandslash, Taj the Raichu, Jura the Golem, Mokuba the Charizard, Fizzla the Blastoise, and new to the team is Miku the Alolan Muk. We enter the Hall of Champions ready to claim our title, and the first person in our way is Elite Four Lorelei. Lorelei leads with Dugong as Alan sets up Stealth Rocks. I plan on taking it out with a couple Brick Breaks, but at a 3 level deficit, it's already showing its consequences. We take too much damage with Waterfalls, and I can't two-shot it in return. I make an emergency switch to Vizsla and Mega Evolve to survive enough hits before Dark Pulse eventually gets the KO. Jinx is up next and falls to two Dark Pulses while Vizsla dodges some unwanted kisses. Slowbro is a similar story. Lapras comes out to slowly whittle away at Vizsla with Dragon Pulses. When it gets low enough, we switch to Miku, who can barely take it out with two Thunder Punches, avoiding a critical hit or freeze from Blizzard. Last is Cloyster, who poses almost no threat. Taj can switch in, and after the Stealth Rock damage, one Thunderbolt secures the victory. Unlike Lorelei, every other member of this Elite Four possesses a Pokémon that can pretty easily sweep our team if we aren't careful. Next up is Bruno. His fighting ground and rock coverage mean I'm basically walking into this battle with half a team. We lead with Vizsla and Mega Evolve to take out Onix before he can set up Stealth Rocks. That brings out Hitmonchan, so expecting a Thunder Punch, we switch to Jura to get off our own Stealth Rocks. But a lucky Ice Punch Freeze takes us out for a few turns. We can only get off one Thunder Punch before dropping below 20%, and I'm forced to hard switch into Mokuba to try and get the kill with Wing Attack. After getting a critical hit, I'm kinda scared I needed that crit. Hitmonlee comes out next to avenge his brother with a rock slide, so we switch to Miku to get off a Toxic. Muk isn't known for her physical defense, and we're also forced to switch back into Mokuba to take a Brick Break. Now, fearing a rock slide, I switch into Vizsla. A Surf plus Toxic damage takes out Hitmonlee, but our team is getting very low. Superpower Polyrath comes out Polyrath. next. Polyrath is 70, so I should 150% outspeed this Polyrath. And I can set up a Reflect. <laughs> What the hell? Okay. <laughs> okay. I live it anyway. <laughs> I do not 150% outspeed this Polyrath, who is 8 speed points slower than me, but whatever. Luckily, Vizsla doesn't take a critical hit, and now with a Reflect Up, we can switch into Taj and hope Bruno hasn't learned from Giovanni on how to ignore Reflect boosts. Luckily, Taj doesn't beat the same fate that Kaiba did, and we take out Polyrath with two Thunderbolts, but out comes Machamp. This is what peak performance looks like. He is more than tanky enough to live a psychic from Taj, and with superpower, earthquake, and rock slide, nothing on my team can switch into him. I can't toxic stall him with Miku, I can't wall him with Jura or Alan, and he takes hits from Taj and Mokuba. With the very last turn of Reflect, in the memory of Kaiba pushing our team forward, I watch Machamp live a psychic and fire off a super effective earthquake. Kaiba's spirit lives on in Taj as we hang on in the red, the reflect fades away, and one final psychic wins us the second Elite Four battle. 
Agatha is up next, and her team feels a little weird. Unlike Bruno, she can't threaten us with her entire team, but those two Gengars are definitely tough to get around. She leads with Arbok as we lead with Alan for another stealth rock. However, getting paralyzed by Glare and losing some defense from Crunch makes Alan unreliable for the rest of the fight. Mokuba comes in on a 30% crunch and Mega Evolves to boost our physical attack. Earthquake takes out the Arbok and brings out the first Gengar. The Sludge Bomb brings us to the yellow, but Earthquake is enough to get the KO. Weezing is next up, so we switch into Jura on the Sludge Bomb and get poisoned. The follow-up Shadow Ball brings us to 57 HP while our Earthquake barely tickles. I swap into Miku and begin digging just to chip away at the Weezing. Uh, yep, we can just dig here. Excuse me, did we just reverse speed tie? Did you really hit me before I dug and then after I came back up? And then before I dug again? Now that some nonsense has dropped us so low, the second Gengar is even scarier than usual. I'm forced to switch into Vizsla, but take a Dazzling Gleam, Shadow Ball, and Poison before I can get off one Earthquake. Of course, that Earthquake only does about half. Gengar will outspeed anyone I send in, so Miku somehow just has to live two hits to get off a crunch. The first Sludge Bomb brings us to 52 HP, and we barely manage to live a Dazzling Gleam on 10 HP. Golbat is last, but Taj can switch in on a quick attack and take it out with one Thunderbolt thanks to the Stealth Rock damage. Last up is Bird Keeper Lance. He leads with Seedra, the only non-flying type on his team. We lead with Alan and dodge a Hydro Pump to set up Stealth Rock. The following Hydro Pump, though, brings us down to 52 HP, while our Earthquake only does around 30. I need to switch Alan out, so I go into Vizsla, but for some reason Lance also switches, and he goes into Aerodactyl. With that free switch, we just Mega Evolve and take it out with a Surf, only to see Seedra brought back in. A Hyper Beam brings us to 53, while then I miss a Toxic. On the recharge turn, we land the second shot at Toxic, and then protect to squeeze out as much damage from Vizsla as possible. With Aerodactyl out of the picture, this is a pretty painless switch into Miku, who takes about 25% from a Hyper Beam. A Thunder Punch on the charge turn takes out Seedra. Lance must just be blind, because his next Pokemon is Gyarados, who falls to a Thunder Punch. Charizard takes half from the rocks while I scout with Protect. Needing to now take a Hyper Beam, I switch into Jura on a critical hit before taking it out with Rock Slide. I'm pretty confident Jura can live in Outrage, so we click Rock Slide again. I don't think a non-crit Hyper Beam kills, and I don't think one Outrage kills. So I'm gonna Rock Slide. Come on, Jura. Come on, Jura. Come on, Jura. Oh, it was another fucking crit? Really? I get double crit. Are we being serious right now? Oh my god. Unfortunately, with all the time Jura and Kaiba spent together during this journey, Jura couldn't stand the idea of becoming champion if it wasn't alongside his best friend, Kaiba. Taking two back-to-back -back crits in his honor Jura falls to an outrage, giving us our first death of the Elite Four. But hope is not lost, as Kaiba left us his strongest card before he passed. We send out Mokuba to refresh our Reflect and land a Dragon Pulse. Unfortunately, that Dragon Pulse only lightly aggravates Dragonite. Even after two super effective attacks and confusion damage, Dragonite lives on 1 HP and fires off another outrage. Mokuba manages to dodge the critical hit and finally takes out Lance. That just leaves Trace and his level 56 Mega Pidgeot standing between us and our first successful Artlock Champion battle. We lost to Leon back to back and lost our first battle against Cynthia, but I believe even with our level disadvantage, this team can take on the Indigo League. Champion Trace leads with his Mega Pidgeot. My original plan was to Stealth Rock with Jura, but plan B, we lead with Miku to get off a Toxic. A mix of Protects and Thunder Punches bring Pidgeot low enough for Trace to burn a full restore. We Toxic a second time as Miku is starting to fall very low, but eventually the big bird falls victim to the poison and in comes Rapidash. Uh, that kind of throws a wrench into my plans. What I thought was going to happen was Marowak would come out next, so I could switch to Mokuba on a Bone Morang since it doesn't have any rock coverage. Now I kind of just need to eat a Flare Blitz, so I switch to this look. Two Flare Blitzes bring us down to 40% as a Surf doesn't get the KO. My plan on using Vizsla to tank Slowbro just went out the window, so now I have to risk a critical hit to take out Rapidash. With the horse put out to pasture, Trace sends out... Vileplume? 
Only one member is worthy of dealing with this Pokémon. We summon our Blue Eyes White Dragon to tank the Solar Beam and take out Vileplume and two flamethrowers. Trace may want to use Psychological Warfare on us, but it won't work. Next up is Jolteon. I switch to Alan as he dodges one Thunder, but the second one hits us for 75%. Our Earthquake isn't enough for the KO. With Slowbro still waiting in the back, along with Marowak, I can't afford to switch into anyone else. I say my goodbyes to Alan as the next Thunder crashes down from above and completely misses. Alan sidesteps the blast and nails Jolteon with another Earthquake. With that play, finally Marowak comes out, so we switch to Mokuba on a Fire Punch and use Toxic. The best Marowak can do is Brick Break, as we slowly take it out with a few Flamethrowers. On the last turn, I don't expect Bone Meringue to be a problem anymore, so we Mega Evolve, but our Flamethrower is instead taken by Slowbro as he comes out to save his teammate. Unsurprisingly, it does no damage, and then we have to switch to Miku. Slowbro sets up a Light Screen. We Toxic, but I expect the Surf to take Miku out. I continue to underestimate Muk as he lives on 24 HP and can stall out a couple more turns with Protect. Now expecting another Surf, we switch into Taj who takes half health from it. Assuming we can dodge a crit, we can set up a Light Screen and stall with Toxic. Uh, turns out Trace has another full restore, but the Light Screen ends and two Thunderbolts take it out anyway. Money doesn't buy victories, Trace. What do you think this is? The real world? No, in Pokemon you can win with hard work. Trace doesn't like my insinuation that he's only obtained his status in life thanks to his money and connections, and switches to Marowak to waste my turn with Thunderbolt. Luckily for me, the guy is poisoned and Psychic just takes it out no problem. And you see kids, unlike in the real world, no matter how hard you work, a small group of terrible people will always win. In the Pokemon world, with hard work and strategy, you can overcome impossible odds to achieve your dreams. Oh shit. After Taj shows us the limits of using a Pokemon with a sub-100 attacking stat and zero bulk, we're forced to switch back into Vizsla as the Toxic takes out Marowak. One final Dark Pulse takes out the Slowbro and wins us our championship battle. With only two deaths in the Elite Four, we are crowned the new champion of Kanto. But wait, why did we pick a level 85 level cap? Where did I even get that number from? Oh, now it's really time to see how hard this game can get. You see, at the end of Kanto lies three trainers who tower over the rest, named after the games that started it all. Green, blue, and red. Oh wait, switch those Pokemon around. There we go. Our world has expanded and two more level caps have just been added. With a level cap of 58, we must create a new team to challenge Mewtwo, Green, and Blue. And if we make it past their level 67 Pokemon, we can challenge Red and his 85s with a new level cap of 72. First, we had to Cerulean Cave and Toxic Stall Mewtwo with Miku, then throw 70 Pokeballs before we can battle Green. Our team mostly focuses on high base stat total Pokemon who can survive throughout long fights, whittling you down before her Gengar and Mega Blastoise can finish you off. Our team for this battle is Mira the Needle Queen, Miku the Muk, Noelle the Gyarados, Dragonov the Venomoth, Mokuba the Charizard, and new to the team, Shinji the Tentacruel. A uh, face? Is that a robot? She assaults us with the Pokeball to get us off balance before she sends out her Clefable. Dragonov is able to take it out in three sludge bombs, but took around 35% in the process. Ninetales comes out next, so we have to switch to Mokuba expecting a Fire Blast. Even resisted, it does 25%, before then outspeeding with a Hyper Beam. Oh my god, you could miss some of these low accuracy moves. Oh! Oh no! So you can land all of those moves, but I can't land a fucking Toxic. Sure. Sure. Whatever. That free Earthquake sure would have been nice, but... But no. I'm just gonna take a Hyper Beam and then miss my move. That makes sense. Alright, we're gonna switch into Muck. Muck's the only thing that can handle a hit from this stupid thing. Miku crunches for a solid chunk of damage before dozing off to heal from these apparently 100% accurate Fire Blasts and Hyper Beams. Next up is Victory Bell, but Power Whip crits us for 50%, because of course it does! So it comes Victory Bell. This thing cannot hurt me very badly. It can hurt, but... Oh shit, never mind. it can just obliterate me for fun, because it gets a crit. Use another one. 
Oh, did you double crit me? Yeah, woo! Let's go. I'm missing toxics. I'm getting hit with low accuracy moves. I'm getting double crit. This is this is wonderful. I'm already 10 levels below. But sure, let's just give them that kind of luck. That makes, that makes perfect sense. At this point, I just have to hope her luck has run out so I can rest all the rest of Power Whip PP. I managed to dodge enough crits while tanking every single one of these 85% accurate moves from two different Pokemon. Eventually, Victory Bell is forced to Poison Jab and I can take it out with a few crunches. Out comes Kangaskhan with the consistently high damage stab Dizzy Punch. I need to Toxic Stall it out. Yes. Okay, okay. Please, Muck. Please. 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 Me. You? Come on! Really? <sighs> this whole battle! I just get super smacked by everything all the time. That's ridiculous. Switch in a mirror, I guess. Th oh. I mean, double crit in a row, get hit by every single fire blast, get hit by every single power whip, miss my toxics, hit myself in confusion, get confused. Alright, mirror, this is essentially the only thing you can do is land this toxic. And unfortunately, I think that has to be it for us. It was a very good run. I enjoyed having you on the team for this long. Aww. Oh. Well, I'm just gonna get Thunder Punch. It should have been Dragon Ops, actually. This is fine. This is fine. This is fine. We're gonna Mega Evolve. We're gonna Waterfall, and it's gonna do huge damage. And we're a tanky Mega Gyarados. We can live one. We can live a non-stab Thunder Punch from Kangaskhan, right? Oh Lord. That did not do as much as it needed to. We do in fact live one Thunder Punch, but I get scared and switch to Venomoth basically for free on a Brick Break as the Toxic takes out Kangaskhan. Next up is Gengar. I don't know how we make it out of this, so I think I just Psychic. Thank you, Captain Dragnaw. Thank you for your help. Oh, it's been an honor using a Venomoth. Nicole, who we just have to pray can live one Sludge Bomb. Just live one sludge bomb, please. Please. Oh, you will us? Oh, you could have missed. You could have missed. That would have been great. 75% accurate. But whatever. Get off a stab. Super effective crunch. Perfect. Come on, Noel. Come on, Noel. Sludge bomb. Yes. And another crunch. Perfect. So that just leaves Mega Blast Toys. Luckily, our new team member was specifically trained to stall this thing out. Shinji does get in the robot and toxic stalls and protects and Mega Drains. Luckily for us, we managed to dodge a Hydro Pump. That would have done a massive, unbearable 20%. Oh my goodness. Progression to the mean when it doesn't matter, you know? All the important moves hit us every single time. But these like random throwaway moves that we don't need, Nah, we're dodging all of them! Shinji's just bobbing and weaving! All these Hydro Pumps that will do 4 damage to us? Never gonna hit! The Fire Blasts and Power Whips that are gonna one-shot us? Of course they hit! You know, our Toxics? They're gonna miss, but no. Will-O-Wisp, that's gonna hit our physical attacker every time. So, we actually lost some Pokémon that I planned on bringing into my fights against Blue and Red, so a whole new team now needs to be built. Going into blue, we have Miku, Vizsla, and Alan, along with three new team members. We add Karibo the Tangela. Karibo Brothers, activate Star Defense! BB the Jolteon. And Spyro the Aerodactyl. Uh, hi, I'm Spyro. What are you, some kind of goat? And if you're wondering where BB is from, she is from My Manga Majoral, which you should go check out after this video. Oh, that does so much more than I thought it would. I thought I'd be able to take two of those. I should've used candies. I should've gone and got a bunch of defense candies. Ooh, that saps a lot of HP though. Perfect, so we can protect. Okay, sweet, good job, Karibo. We can Mega Drain. 
Come on, Karibo. Come on, Karibo. Yes, 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 yes. Believe in the heart of the cards. A little bit of HP back from Mega Drain. In comes Gyarados, who I assume outrages? We can just Leech Seed. This is as far as I expected Karibo to make it. We might live one and it's not Stab. Karibo did exactly what I needed her to do. Outlasting Tauros was her only goal, but living an outrage from Gyarados and getting off Leech Seed is fantastic. We can protect through the next turn of damage, but this is where we say goodbye. Either I get outsped and killed with Outrage, or I risk the double protect and confusion chance to get one more turn of healing. Unfortunately for me, I underestimated Karibo, and actually, I would have lived another Outrage, so I could have Mega Drained. Smack yourself? No. Alright, thank you for your service, Karibo. Oh, <gasps> he lives it. He lives it. I should have. Oh, I should have Mega Drained. I didn't think he'd live. It was not the smarter play, it was the dumber play. Thanks to his incredible work, BB can come out for free and take out the Gyarados. Aerodactyl is up next, but a huge chunk from Thunderbolt will be worth losing Jolteon. We get outsped and lose BB in only two turns, but the Aerodactyl is now low enough for Vizsla to finish it off. We get the KO, but we've now basically traded two and a half Pokemon for three. Next up is Executor. Oh, four times super effective X Scissor does not one shot Executor. That's what we just learned. I don't know how. I have a. Uh, oh, shit. I needed Alan from Red Fight. What a joke. Alright, here comes. Alright. Okay, okay. Switch into Spyro. Switch into Spyro. Mega Evolve. I'm so scared a Crunch doesn't kill though if he's this tanky, but I don't want to miss a fly. But we'll make a ball and we'll fly. Sweet! Good job, Spyro. Who's Alec Um. We know he's gonna Psychic, so maybe the clean switch and look. As much as my brain is like, just press Crunch! Crunch kills! Alec lightning fast, and we're 10 levels down, so I don't wanna. I don't want to mess with it too much. At this point, you know the story. We Toxic, Protect, Crunch, Protect, and Rest. Mega Charizard Y is last, and a Fire Blast easily two-shots Miku, so we have to hard switch into Vizsla. After all his work, a Fire Blast plus Hyper Beam are what are finally enough to crack through Vizsla's shell. But his sacrifice wins us the battle, as now Spyro can come in for free and has two chances to land a Rock Slide for the victory. Now, with a 13 level deficit, it is finally time to challenge the real champion of Let's Go Pikachu. We assemble the absolute best Pokemon from our box to take on this challenge. All of our fallen Pokemon have died so that we could be here. And now these six Pokemon are going to give it their all to win us this challenge. Miku, Noel, and Mokuba are joined by three new team members. Juvia the Lapras, Senku the Yololan Executor. Let's call ass, citizens of the Kingdom of Science! And King Hercules the Machamp. <laughs> and without even a word, the battle begins. First up is Pikachu versus Senku. Some toxic stalling along with the strong psychic takes out Red's weird looking Pikachu with us still above half health. Next up is Lapras, but little does he know, we have the perfect counter. Juvia comes out on an Ice Shard and uses Toxic. The clock is ticking though, as Megahorn brings us below half. After a Protect, we risk the crit and manage to get a Thunderbolt off, barely surviving in the red afterwards. We Protect next turn to get one more tick of damage before the Ice Shard can take us out. But as I prepare to let Juvia fall, I hear her voice in my head. Believe in me, I cannot fall here. She nods as we lock in for a second Protect, rolling the dice on a 50-50 chance. Juvia manages to save herself from the second Ice Shard as the Toxic takes out Lapras. That means we can now get a small amount of damage off with Ice Shard on Machamp, as well as get a free switch thanks to Juvia's heroic actions. In his blind rage, Red's Machamp fires off a superpower, crippling his attack and defense for the rest of the match. We send in Mokuba and Mega Evolve to get a super effective Air Slash for only 40%. Ooh, that does not do a- oh my god, we get the flinch. It's like, that doesn't do a lot of damage. <laughs> we get the flinch, but I mean, we're fighting. 
something? Oh my god! <laughs> I looked over and I like saw it in the corner of my eye and my head just like swam back and forth. Good shit, Mokuba! We got the double protect and the- oh my god, you know what? Gen 3 Hunter's right. Progression towards the mean. It's- we got absolutely destroyed in the blue battle, but not today. Lapras was brought here just for Lapras. Muck was brought here. Why did you put it? Sweet, that's actually great for us. And Muck was brought here just for Snorlax. <laughs> we brought a bunch of very hyper specific counters towards Red and a Machamp for like, if shit goes sideways. We have Machamp. <laughs> oh, that hurts so bad. I was hoping I could live two, but I, don't, I guess Snorlax's attack is that. Good or my defense is that bad? That's fine. This is literally the last battle of the game. That's fine. Thank you, Miku. You have been unbelievably valuable. I think uncontested for the Elite Four, Blue, Green, and Red. Miku, the Alolan Muck, has been our MVP. After all she has done for us in the late game, it's time to lay Miku to rest. After landing a Toxic on Snorlax and stalling a couple turns with Protect and Rest, she falls to two body slams. Thank you, Miku. We'll scatter your ashes in the Wi-Fi. In comes King Hercules. I have no idea how to pronounce Hercules, so Hercules it is. With all of his perfectly toned muscles and extensive combat training, he throws a super effective brick break into Snorlax's soft, jiggly belly for only 20% before we get toxic. Next up, though, is Arcanine, and I know the king has done his job. Expecting a heat wave to take us out, I lock in Earthquake. Perfect, there goes Snorlax. Did enough. You did enough, Hercules. You did your job. So, I am okay with staying in an Earthquake thing. Because he has to- Oh my god, he mi- What is happening? I was like, he can't will o -wisp me, so I might as well get one off. You're my favorite new character in Radiant for a reason? After that embarrassing miss, Arcanine realizes he can't hold a candle to the peak perfection that is King Hercules the Machamp, and would rather roar us into Executor than continue to take Earthquakes. But now staring into Senku's deep red eyes, Arcanine has to submit to defeat, choosing Will-O-Wisp rather than Heatwave and falling to an Earthquake. Uh, okay, okay, an Earthquake plus Psychic. Last up is Mega Venusaur. Sludge Bomb takes out Senku as we switch back into Mokuba. Our flamethrower barely does 30% as we're hit with a Leech Seed. Thanks to Leech Seed and Amnesia, Mokuba's unable to break through, and just like his brother, falls to a critical hit one shot. Now that Venusaur is burned, we can send in Noel to finish the job, surviving a Sludge Bomb. We have defeated Champion Red with one final crunch. Even at 85% of our level cap, he was no match. We award Miku the star mark as the MVP of the run. And with that, this art lock is won. Two Pokemon remain, standing tall above the Kanto region, thanks to the hard work of all who came before them. Now we set our sights on either Hisui or Paldea, but until then, please consider following along my journey to publish my action manga major and subscribe for more videos. Thank you for watching. Thank you.